And when you speak, uh, if you're punctuate, if you're stressing correctly, it actually sounds like music. There's a wave to it. All languages have it. In fact, if you listen to a son speak Tagalog, his speeches, they're beautiful. They're very musical. Okay, because there's also that wave that comes across. And that was happening here. He, he, he was punctuating. He was stressing correctly. And it sounded very musical. Supposing there was a way for you to hone your presentation skill such that you could have the audience at the palm of your hand, no matter what it is that you would present, wouldn't that be of benefit for you? Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Episode 5, Season 1 of Tip Talks. This is where we analyze speeches from famous personalities and see how techniques which they had applied could be useful whenever we deliver presentations or speeches. I'd like them to introduce themselves, please. Let's start off with uh, Dino. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, the short version of it is that I'm a DTM. I'm a consultant, a coach, a speech coach, a vocal dynamics coach as well. And thank you so much, Raul. Uh, back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Dino. And next, uh, please, let's welcome Paul. Paul, please. Thank you, Raul. Similar to Dino, I also am a consultant, but I focus mostly on uh, leadership facilitation, especially the soft skills. And I'm quite sure you can just tell by looking at me that I've been to infinity and beyond maybe twice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to you, Raul. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. And of course, joining us as well is Eileen. Eileen, please. Good evening, everyone. My name is Eileen. I'm a mother of four. I'm an electronics and communications and engineer. And for the most part of my 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 career, I have been an academic teacher. So that's it. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Eileen. As for myself, my name is Raul. Oh, oftentimes, uh, you'd find me at, as a corporate trainer in a business process outsourcing company. And if I'm not in, if I'm not at work, uh, nor here at Tip Talks, I would be attending Toastmasters meetings. Just like Dino, I'm also a distinguished Toastmaster. Now. For today's episode, we are going to analyze the speech of one gentleman whom I'm sure you probably get to see a lot of every so often. None other than Benigno Aquino Jr. And we will analyze his speech from 1981, which was delivered in Los Angeles situation in the Philippines. I think this Japanese explained the situation in the Philippines very well. As you very well know, the Japanese have a difficulty pronouncing their R's. Manila becomes Manira. And so this Japanese gentleman stood up and said, My dear Filipino people, you are very rocky. And I consider, he said, the Filipino people the most rocky people in Asia. And the people were, of course, surprised. They wanted to know why, were, why they were lucky. He said, you know why you are lucky? You have a president who robs you. And you have a first lady who robs you more. Okay, uh, Raul. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dino. Now, folks, a little background on that portion which we just heard. That was the introduction of Benigno Aquino's speech. I'd like to hear your comments on how you found that. And uh, please, uh, Dino, you can start with you. Okay. <laughs> well, um, 
my thoughts are that he is uh, a very witty, eloquent speaker. Uh, unlike Corey, who we analyzed previously, uh, Ninoy was, well, you could say almost born to be what he was. Um, I've always enjoyed listening to his speeches because he, he could speak so fast, yet I could understand him. And he had this unique ability to tickle the funny bone in a way that was hilarious. Um, of course, the stuff that he says would be exaggerated, but they really, they really knew how to grab uh, an audience. And people love to laugh. And if you make them laugh at the start of a speech, you've got them. Back to you, Raul. Thank you very much, Dino. Yes, uh, something that I am impressed with is Nino's ability to use humor, especially at the onset of a speech. And yes, it does get the attention of an audience. Uh, your comments, Paul, please. Thank you, Raul. Uh, you know, even when we do the Toastmaster speeches, nobody volunteers for the humorous speech. <laughs> okay. Because it, admittedly, it is difficult. Mm. And when you start writing it and you read your humor 10 times, it doesn't sound funny anymore. Mm. <laughs> but humor, humor definitely helps, especially mm -hmm. if it's at the beginning of a speech. It definitely will get the attention. Mm. And if you know if if it's something you want to develop it, develop it. But at the same time, if you're not good at it, I suggest you don't even try. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> because if if it, it'll just come out wrong. Mm -hmm. And actually, what's amazing is, uh, uh, considering the context of the speech and the time, it, it was a that, that's rather edgy the humor. Okay. Uh. So it, it's it's rather edgy and. Can you imagine doing that today? Do you think you can get away with it? Uh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> All right. so, I'll just be quiet instead. Mm -hmm. But uh, at, as Dino and you pointed out, Raul, uh, it's the the power of humor at the beginning. Definitely. It's a, it's a very strong, uh, how would you say, hook, if you want to say. Mm -hmm. Back to you, Raul. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Yes, indeed, it is uh, quite the hook, uh, especially when you get to use uh, humor. And, uh, you know, I, I realized something about that. Uh, you know, when you mentioned that sometimes you try to make a speech, you try to make it humorous, and before you know it, later on when you deliver it, people just don't react the way you hope. There's also another side of the coin. You know, you try to write something serious you know, to make a point. But later on, when you de deliver it, the audience would start laughing. They would wonder, hey, what the, why are they laughing? I'm trying, I'm very serious here. <laughs> I've experienced that a number of times. Okay. You saw it also one time, Dino, you know, in, a, in a speech that I delivered. I never really expected that kind of uh, reaction. But then it just goes to show how... Um, uh, how humor does play a big part in public speaking. Uh, yes, uh, Eileen, your thoughts, yes. please. Uh, I, I guess the reason why he started with a humorous um, anecdote or the interview regarding, you know, that that you're rocky because you have a president who robs you. A pan, um, you know, it's supposed to be a president who loves you. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's that's the the essence of the the actual speech but because of the the japanese interpretation or the japanese um wordings instead of love he says robs and the you have a uh, first lady who robs you more you know it it gives that that impact because the speech will become serious later on mm -hmm. so starting with something humorous calls in the the audience so that they will be engaged immediately. So True. that's what it means. True. True. Uh, just to uh, add to that, you know, the first time I heard that speech was in 19, uh, 1984. 19, now, that speech was delivered in uh, 1981 in the States. And 
a, cl a close friend of mine told me, hey, Raul, let's uh, listen to this speech. I'll never forget it. You know? I had we had just finished watching a pirated version of uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. <laughs> and then after that was the speech of Ninoy. I, that's why to this day I still remember that particular speech. Uh, uh, a little bit of background for that portion. Did you know that this that speech which he delivered, uh, Ninoy talks about the difficulties that he encountered. And he also talks about mm, what kind of hardships he had to endure mm -hmm. while he was uh, incarcerated. Yet, instead of starting with something somber, he used humor. Mm -hmm. He used humor to catch the attention of the audience. And later on, he segues to his important points. Again, mm, even if that speech was delivered in 19... 81, uh, he still uses techniques that are very, uh, very much recommended in public speaking. All, All right. right. Thank so... you. They brought me to a mountain hideout in the Sierra Madre and placed me in a box. I had only my brief and my T-shirt. I refused to eat because I thought they were poisoning me. There was nothing in the room, barely nothing. And I had nothing to do but twiddle my thumb and for the first time in my life, I heard the ticking of every second and I was counting every second into minutes. And as the minutes marched into hours and the hours into days and days into weeks, I knew what loneliness meant. For seven years, I was not allowed to see the moon and the stars. There were days where they left me all alone by myself. I had no reading material. I had nothing. I was twiddling my thumb. I would walk and walk and walk across my room. There's a room of about four meters by five meters. Hoping that I'll get tired. And then when I get tired, I will fall asleep. Knowing that tomorrow will be the same. All right. So I guess we could pause there. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dino. I'd like to point out a technique which, which Nino uses there. Notice how he uses picturesque yeah. language. You mm -hmm. cannot help but imagine what was there. Okay, so he says, Sierra Madre, brief and t-shirt, four meters by five meters, not allowed to see the moon and the stars, you know, things like that. <laughs> so it's one way to engage. It's one way to engage an audience by using specifics. Uh, mm. Mm, Dino, your comments, please. Let's start with Okay. Well, my thoughts on that is that he likes to use simple language so that he can appeal to as broad an audience as he can, knowing uh, that he he was being listened to not just by locals, but by an international audience. So, of course, he, he won't be using Tagalog, but, uh, but in a portion of that speech he did, uh, yes. briefly, um, I still thought that his, his approach was very folksy. Um, mm -hmm. Though it was difficult for him, for sure it was difficult for him and certainly painful because he also had a heart condition. But he never once showed in his delivery that um, he was bitter about it. Um, yes. he, he, he showed that he was willing to suffer that others mm -hmm. may have a better future. So uh, that was what made his speech to me charming as well. Simple language and without the bitterness in it. Back to you, Raul. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dino. Yes, indeed. When you use words, phrases that are easy to understand, you're a whole lot better yeah, in connecting with mm -hmm. your audience. So, folks, uh, if ever you get to communicate with others, it goes to show no jargon, no complicated uh, words. And in fact, when you be as conversational as possible, better chances of connecting with your audience. Uh, your comments, please, Paul. Uh, let's let's listen for from Eileen first. Mm -hmm. Okay, the way Ninoy wove his narrative 
to me is, is so simple that even if you have no idea or no um, uh, prior understanding of what was going on in the Philippines, you would be able to understand it because his words are so simple, his narratives are factual and precisely detailed. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not a Filipino, or rather if you're an American, um, you will still be able to feel the anguish, you will be able to feel the, the drama, and mm -hmm. yet there were no judgments. In fact, I was telling my husband, he's so factual in his narrative, that he does not have any room for judging or judgments. Mm -hmm. He did not say anything to despise or mm -hmm. to, to um, go against uh, those people who implemented or who, mm -hmm. who gave him the, you know, the torture. He mm -hmm. never said a word against them. Mm -hmm. To him, it was what happened. Uh, those details were, were in the past and something that cannot be taken personally from, from somebody who's supposed to be uh, considered a traitor, considered a mm -hmm. uh, uh, communist. Mm -hmm. So he never made any judgments against his tormentors. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel that Ninoy was a very, very good speaker because he did not make any motherhood statements. Mm -hmm. He did not make any... Uh, I forgot the term, but he did not um, say or blame, he did not put any blame on other people except what happened is something that happened because of circumstances that put him there because he was the opposition at that time. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I think sila Raul Manlapos, the other opposition people, Siltanyada were rounded off already. They were being rounded off and they were being asked to swear allegiance to the new society. It was only, sila Laurel, it was only Ninoy who was defiant to the end. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Arlene. You know, a couple of points there that you've shared, which I, which I say is very important, you know, uh, coming across as factual. That is effective in establishing your credibility. And second is the way uh, Ninoy presents these facts. It, it's not like him presenting himself as the victim, no. He just says, this is what happened. You know? And you can't help but think, hey, wait a minute, this guy was treated unfairly. So, and the folks are able to easily conclude that uh, he got the short end of the stick. Uh, comments, Paul, please. Yeah, uh, Just uh, two things. You, you know, the power of imagination and how we can actually translate it into something useful for us, especially if, if you facilitate courses uh, in the corporate world, or even anywhere. Uh, I'll just give you a slightly different scenario where Let's say you're in a coaching class and you want the participants to to prepare for a coaching session with one other staff. So you might say, okay, uh, you have to prepare for a coaching session. Uh, what items do you bring? Okay, that's one way to say it. The other way to say it is imagine you're about to go into the coaching session and what items would you bring? Just by adding the imagine in front of it, it then encourages thinking because usually if you ask the question the first way you just get a bunch of blank stares you know oh, what am i going to do <laughs> okay but say imagine and then they, they could start you know thinking of what what they actually bring so you know using the imagination is it's very very powerful and even in simple ways like 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 i the example i gave it, it really works the other good the, the other excellent thing about the speech is he has a mastery of english Okay, because English is actually a sound-based language. And that's what makes it difficult to teach. We teach it as an alphabet, but it's sound-based. Uh, just to give you a simple example, I can say, you know, I asked you to buy me red roses. That's one version. Then I'll say, I asked you to buy me red roses. I'm saying the exact words, but I just stressed a different word. I changed the meaning. 
And especially for English speakers, they look for those words. They listen for the words that you're that you're punctuating or you're stressing, and it and and that gives meaning. Okay, and when you speak, uh, if you're punctuate, if you're stressing correctly, it actually sounds like music. There's a wave to it. All languages have it. In fact, if you listen to a son speak Tagalog, his speeches they're beautiful. They're very musical. Okay, because there's also that wave that comes across. And that was happening here. He 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 was punctuating. He was stressing correctly, and it sounded very musical. Back to you, Raul. All right. Thank you very much, Paul. Now, a, a couple of things I picked up from uh, what Paul had just shared. First, you know, when you get your audience to start thinking, you know, it is a good way of engaging, and it guarantees that you that they're going to pay attention to you as you continue to make your point. And then second, which I like is, uh, yes, as we get to apply English, the way we use emphasis could definitely change the meaning of what we are trying to convey. So as we speak in English, make sure though that you uh, emphasize on the keywords that would support the meaning of your uh, message. Okay. You know, right. I'm going to so, listen to any other Yes, uh, let's go on with the, uh, with the video. My friends, I cannot understand the temerity and the gall of these people. Eh, kang ganon, be practical. Eh, talagang ganun eh. Makibagay ka na, ikaw, napakalakas ka ng bagyo eh. Ikaw lahi ka mahihirapan diyan. Mag-isa ka dyan. Hindi bali kang ganon. Kung ayaw mo nang sumulat, eh, tumawag ka na lang sa telepono, ibulong mo na lamang. Ayos na. I would like to tell you that I was tempted in my 7,000, almost 7,285 days in prison to do just that. I am only human. Ako po isang tao lamang. When my wife and children would visit me and they would leave me at task after one hour, I also would like to enjoy the embrace of my children and the peace of my home. But if I gave faith in that conviction, if I refuse to accept the jurisdiction of a military court and because I refuse to defend myself, they will give me the death sentence. I vowed to myself that because you have elected me to the Senate and I gloried in its pomp, therefore it is now time that, that's my, I am, uh, that I must suffer the consequences of my act. And because I knew, they were paraded before me. I never saw them in my life. And yet they were pointing fingers at me, accusing me of crimes I never committed. They admitted to crimes. They said they were communists. They said they were number three in the communist hierarchy. And yet the government set them free, and I was in jail. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dino. Uh, uh, I know that a while ago we talked of, uh, about uh, him speaking in Tagalog. Now, mind you, uh, this goes to show how he knew who his audience mm. was. Uh, mm. He knew that there were several Filipinos there, which is why every so often he would break into Tagalog. Yeah. Especially uh, the anecdotes. That uh, that way, he also connects with majority of the audience. Uh, do you know your, your comments, please? Some of you had heard. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, you know... It's part of our culture. It's part of our behavior that when somebody popular and we admire uh, travels, um, a lot of Filipinos will tend to go with them. Uh, for example, every time Pacquiao has a, mm -hmm. has a fight, say in Madison Square Garden, for sure, uh, Chavit Singh Son will be there. And yes. several of, of uh, his friends and relatives would also be there. So he, you're right. He wasn't just communicating to Americans, he was also communicating to the to the people, uh, the local community that were surely present at that particular time. I'd also like to, to, to say that in this particular part of his speech, he's starting to show his humanity. Uh, for the yes. first time so far, he is beginning to show some of the pain. Notice, if you will, how he paused ever so slightly when he talked about 
being asked to just ibulong mo na lang, you know, just just whisper it. Mm-hmm. And that that's the first time in in this speech where he showed that he felt the 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 pain and maybe even a little bit of the regret. And, and that's fine because uh I remember that in 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 Calvary uh when Christ uh said, you know, um or you know when he was praying at the sorry at the at the garden so many, saying, could could so could if this cup could be taken away from me right so even at that point he, he showed his humanity and i think that's what endeared him to us and in in a sense that's what endears ninoy to to so many of his fans because when he admits to being human wanting to feel the hug of his children um having people point to him and accuse him um yeah uh here in this part of the speech we we begin to see the the person within the the person who's not trying to be a politician uh, the one who's just trying to explain <laughs> that he 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 was he was in pain emotional as well as physical back to your old okay thank you very much you know uh, folks you see Uh, when we anytime you share a story very important that uh, you talk about a challenge a challenge that you had to face and if it's the kind of challenge where uh, you needed to um, overcome a weakness or let's say uh, it shows you as a as human it is it's also a factor that endears you to your listeners because they can identify with you Uh, your thoughts uh, your thoughts Eileen please uh, I will take a different angle here sure. the fact that he says uh, others who claim to be communists were not taken or imprisoned and yet he was imprisoned shows you how delicate or uh, bad or rotten our social, justice system is it shows you the power of a dictator and whatever rules he wants to implement his world his rule his government so he is the government or marcos was the government marcos was the social justice uh, marcos was the power so i believe that at this point he was already feeling a little bit scared because he was the only one who he i feel that he was the only one standing and even as he was standing for the truth he was standing for the sake of democracy he knew that he was very much not just a minority but the only one now because others have sort of uh flown already they f- they flew and they they sing sinabing bulong mo na lang or mahihirapan ka diyan tells us the situation then that the opposition was no longer anything that can be uh taken as a as a competition for the government mm-hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Eileen. Yes, indeed, that's part. Imagine the difficulty, you know, realizing that uh, you are uh, you're you're alone in in facing uh, insurmountable odds. Especially when he realizes that a lot of his uh, allies had yielded, to say so. To say so. Thank you, and. Paul, please, your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Raul. You know, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I might be wrong with my Philippine history. <laughs> okay. But uh, before, uh, you know, I got involved, let's say he got arrested or was targeted as a communist, if you want to say. Uh, he, I, I believe he belonged to the, the privileged class. Am I right? Uh, in short, I, though, I, would, I would say so. Yeah, yeah. In short, because e- right. even today, yes, you know, the, the 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 privileged class, like the, they feel like they're above the law. Hmm. 
Okay. And if I'm not mistaken, historically speaking, before he got arrested, he felt like he was above the law as well. Hmm. He too. And in this part of the speech, it's the first time that you can clearly see that maybe he feels that, uh, you know, he's actually vulnerable. Okay. Uh, yes, the beginning of the speech talked about not seeing the daylight, not seeing the, uh, not seeing the stars, being all alone, twiddling your thumbs. That's all there. But then here he starts talking about missing the the hugs of his children, the warmth of the embrace, and all of that. And that makes it a little more more uh, how would you say vulnerable and and uh, that he's actually human, if you want to say that he can actually die. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, and maybe that's that that's where it's it changed a little, where the speech became a little darker, if you want to say. Uh, but other than that, uh, that, that's pretty much my observation. Back to you, Raul. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Paul. You know, I I also read the, somewhere how uh, Nino was also a young journalist. In fact, he went over to the Korean War, and just to to observe uh, how things were going there and of course write articles uh, that that was uh, part of his early days as a journalist from what i've read from what i've read yep. and then from there when he got back to the philippines uh found his way into politics okay. all right well thank you and uh do you know is there another yeah. part of the recording uh, so that we're going there's, to listen to? Yeah. Uh, there certainly is okay here we go but I knew that somehow I will regain my freedom. Maybe not in this world, but elsewhere. And I knew that sometime, somewhere, Mr. Marcos and I will meet. And in that meeting, I will have my satisfaction. They allowed me to run. And they made a little corral for me. They brought me out between 11 and 12 o'clock. Every day, they brought me out to exercise. On that particular day of March, as I was walking around my little corral, all of a sudden I developed a chest pain. And then the pain was so terrible that I sat down and I asked my guard to massage my chest and asked him to bring me back. I called for the army doctors, they checked me and they said, muscle spasm lang po yan, that's nothing, just take a rest. And so I rested. But after 40 days, I was so weak, I could not even take a bath, I was shaking. And I told my doctor, I said, look doctor, I don't know, I said, your diagnosis or its accuracy, but I am very, very weak. Please bring me to the Philippine Heart Center and get me an examination. That doctor, fortunately, on that morning, after 40 days, on April 10, 28, his name is Colonel Bayani Garcia, came to my office and said, yes, Senator Sabinia, I will now recommend that they bring you to the Heart Center because Apparently, you're not getting well. Mr. Marcos has just arrived from Honolulu. I will make my recommendation. And I wrote a letter and I told them, if you do not bring me to the heart center, I will be constrained to appeal to the Supreme Court. And so he said, no, sir. Ako na pong bahala, I will talk to the commanding general. At one o'clock that day, a knock on my door came and I was given a letter from the commanding general. I thought it was the approval of my request. When I opened the letter, it was handwritten note and it said, My dear Senator Aquino, it is with deep regret that I inform you, your doctor, Colonel Bayani S. Garcia, died of a massive heart attack an hour ago. <laughs> if you were in my place, here is your doctor telling you that it's a muscle spasm, tapos bigla siya namatay. How do you feel? All right. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dino. Notice how in, in that particular segment, Nidoy is able to, first he switches from talking to about something very serious. Uh, you could feel the sense of tragedy. Then suddenly switches to humor. Mm. <laughs> and you can uh, see that the audience was really uh, reacting with that. Uh, it, it's an effective way of uh, you know uh, you know downplaying the downplaying the seriousness but it gets the people to still think hey wow this was uh, uh, this was indeed a difficult situation mm -hmm. uh, 
Dino, your thoughts on what we had heard, please. Okay. Uh, I thought it was uh, a delicious piece of irony and how irony can be used as an effective tool in a speech, especially because when the doctor did say that it was just a muscle spasm, then later on the doctor passes away from a cardiac arrest. Uh, he made a good point, and I guess he didn't have to explain further than that. <laughs> it's like uh, you don't go to a barber who's bald. <laughs> you go to a barber who's got hair <laughs> or or in the same way that y you don't go to a fitness coach and he's uh, really massive right i mean you you go to somebody who's who, who has the muscles to prove that what he's about to te to teach you works so um yes yes uh, his situation was serious but he learned to downplay it and make us laugh because he, he also wants to inject one more thing in, his, in that part of his speech. He wants to inject hope, the, the, yes. the, the idea of hope that behind every cloud will always be a silver lining and that sacrifice is sometimes its own reward. Back to you, Raul. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Dino. Yes, you could see the way how he is able to uh, get the audience to hear important message, especially, you know, when he shifts from something serious to humor, and then there comes his message, his message of uh, hope. Uh, another thing which I'd also like to add, uh, you might notice how he's able to use uh, specifics. You know? Like he gives the, the number of days that passed, 40 days, the time that it happened, one o'clock, then the person, Colonel Benjamin Garcia, you know, these details, uh, they, they, they definitely add a lot of credibility to this presentation. And your thoughts, uh, Eileen? At the beginning of that part of the speech, I was thinking of how he was spiritually awakened by this um experience of being incarcerated imagine seven years and seven months more or less right am i correct mm -hmm. i think yes. more or less it's it's that amount of time alone tortured every so often humiliated with just the uh, briefs on and a t-shirt on and suffering from hunger so during this time he already shifted his thoughts not just on what is in the material, but what is to come, not just for himself, but for the country he will be serving. I also noticed how he loved life. That's yeah. why he sought medical intervention. He sought it because he knew that in the future, the opposition will be um, leaning on him to ready them for a future fight, so to speak. And he will be the one rallying, rallying them towards this particular fight. So what he wants to offer is something that is not just ex of excellent mind, but of excellent body. Mm -hmm. So nakikita ko yung, yung, yung humor, putting in humor, that means he has that sound mind that he can interject humor into his speech, even as the, the narrative is very serious even if the future of the country is very dire. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, indeed. And uh, that is one way also for uh, folks to, uh, for him to emphasize the, that very important point on his speech. And yes, I like how you were able to observe that indeed he loved life and he's very much uh, willing no, to to make sure that uh, those uh, spasms, which the doctors thought would get uh, checked. In fact, uh, as he mentions, look, if, uh, if I don't get this, I'll take this up to the Supreme Court. Uh, it goes to show his uh, assertiveness in such a situation as well. And uh, go ahead, Paul, your thoughts, please. I'm not too sure uh, where in the speech we are, but is this towards the end already? Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, because because if you look at his storyline, uh, he struggles, he's fighting, 
And then at this point, it's like he's made peace with the whole situation. Okay. <laughs> he said, I'm prepared for whatever happens. He, he, he reached that point. And in, in terms of sequentially in the story, it, it wraps it up very, very nicely. Okay. Uh, the only other political person that I could think of probably went to the same thing, but much longer was uh, Nelson Mandela. <laughs> and uh, when Nelson Mandela got out of uh, out of his prison, he pretty much said the same thing: "If we can't forgive the other people, we're never we're never going to stop fighting." <laughs> okay, <laughs> that, that that's that, that's what it boiled down to. And uh, he was still very, at the beginning of his imprisonment, he was still very he wanted to fight kind of thing. And uh, maybe it was the combination of of his heart condition that made him feel like, okay, I might as well just you know. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm prepared for whatever happens. So, in, in terms of the sequence of the speech, in terms of the story that he was building up, it's it's a good way to end it. You know, you're fighting and then struggling, struggling, and then you realize that okay, really at this point, the best I can do is just be ready for what happens. Mm -hmm. And the the humor, you know, it was excellent. If you started with humor, you end with humor, and how he made everything a lot lighter at the end. Back to you, Raul. All right, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Paul. Well, uh, uh, just to add to that, yeah, well, uh, it, it's not it exactly the end per se, but close to the end. Uh, later on, uh, there's a part there where he gives recommendations. I'm not so sure if we'll have time to listen to that, but he gives recommendations and uh, he, un, uh, under the term uh, Christian socialization. And uh, when, if ever you get to hear that, I, I, uh, you'll get to see how he outlines it. Hey, this is what we can do. So it's a very helpful way when you talk when you get to talk about here are certain problems that are happening and then ending it with uh, uh, with proposed solutions. It's, it, uh, it 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 uh, you can't help but uh, admire the the individual. Okay. Uh, thank you, and. Uh, Dino, are we are we still are we going to listen yeah. to another uh, part? Yes, please. The the final part. Um, yes. I think that we need to listen to this because this is the part where he gets technical. Um, yes. And I I'd like the 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 audience to hear how he manages to not lose us, even though he gets technical. Here goes. Very simply, Christian socialism means to me an equal opportunity for advancement and the full development of the human being. This means that the poorest person in the land must be given the equal opportunity for education. Number two, the Christian socialist believes that the great legitimizer of government is the ballot, not the bullet. And therefore, because we believe in the ballot, we believe in a majority rule. So that if the majority should opt and should win in a contest, then the minority should accept the majority mandate. But we put a culatilla, that the majority, even if it wins, must respect minority rights. Number three, we do not believe in the exploitation of man by man. Meaning, we do not believe in unbridled capitalism, where the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer. In a developed country in America, you may have capitalism. But in a country like the Philippines with very meager resources and a developing economy, we must harness our meager economy and maximize their benefit. And therefore, there should be centralized economic planning and the government must actually give the direction as to prevent any overlap. Finally, I do not believe in the monopoly of basic industries. Why should one family monopolize one electric company in the Philippines? Or why should one family monopolize the ownership of one airline company in the Philippines? Or why should one company monopolize the telephone company in the Philippines? Since the government is funding all of this to begin with, these families are borrowing from government institutions and must depend on government guarantees. Then I say, let the government own them and let the people share in the profit. Christian socialism, therefore, is nothing more than democracy. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's uh, fitting to end there. On to yes. your own. Yes, indeed, uh, Dino. Now, this uh, just goes to show that uh, in any uh, presentation, you just don't talk about the problems, the hardships that are there. Uh, somewhere towards the end, okay, um, we'd like to share to your audience, oh, here's what I believe can be done, or here's a solution that uh, we can provide. I notice how he 
not only defines uh, Christian socialism, uh, socialism, but he also gives uh, four points uh, and when he transitions to these four points so that uh, his audience would uh, get an idea, a clear idea of what he has to say. Uh, on to you, Dino. Um, I think I'll do what Paul did earlier, and that is okay. give way to the only flower uh, oh, among the thorns. Yes, please. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean. please. Um, there are things that uh, I don't quite understand. You telling me or telling us about being lost in, in the speech. He was talking about breaking the monopoly, and yet he wants the government to be the one handling it. As, as of this current um, government, we already know the backside of the government owning um, basic basic utility companies or basic um, services. So to my mind, I, I'm not quite sure I understand what his vision is, but I know he does have one. He, I know that he, at that time, probably it was, um, it was best to, to have that mindset that the government should control everything. But I disagree if that will work at this point. Secondly, I, I, um, I think he, he, um, is very, I, it shows his intelligence in, in his speech because he's not just a politician who, gives platitudes or or talks about platitudes that this is what democracy is all about that sacrifices have to be made so that we'll be able to reach our goals as a democratic people he has a plan he has um already a uh, plan a plan b plan c just as what we are talking about we were talking about hope he knew that when he comes home he will be um, you know, incarcerated again. But he did not realize that he would be murdered because he also knew in his heart that Marcos had a conscience and that conscience of his will not allow Aninoy Aquino to be murdered in the Philippines. That would be a grave political mistake. He also knew how brilliant Marcos was. So I, I believe that him preparing for for coming home means giving marcos a competition which is at par with you know the brilliance of marcos because nobody else can compete with marcos at that time not the ulman lapus not the tanyada not uh, certainly not laurel he was the only one who had the the intellect to be at par with the intellect of the Marcos, of, of Marcos. And maybe later in the speech, he will be giving advices to Marcos. But he believes that Marcos will not do anything to harm him, not do anything to um, make his name tarnished because of, of, you know, what happened, well, what eventually happened. He did not believe in that. He had hope. He had hope in the Filipino people, that many a people are not, you know, um, buying the fact that authoritarian rule is the way to go to govern the Philippines. He believed that we as a people um, are worth fighting for. We as a people have to be equal in, 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 uh, like, the Christian so socialism he's talking about. He believes mm -hmm. that everyone has the right to be educated, to have the same opportunities. So that what that is what I believe Ninoy is as a person. Mm -hmm. yes. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Eileen. That's true. Uh, one way on how he uh, espouses uh, Christian socialism uh, it's very possible that he was also thinking of a government that uh, would also practice that, you know, so that the, so that uh, when the utilities would be run by the government, they would also be exercising. Well, he was hoping that they would also be exercising uh, Christian socialism, and 
Uh, yes, indeed. Very inspiring. Uh, very inspiring for Ninoy. Uh, and I, I, so it just doesn't have, uh, it just doesn't have uh, motivation, but there's also, but there's also helpful information uh, when he gives a recommendation towards the end. Uh, on to you, Paul, please. Thank you, Raul. Uh, like a good Toastmaster, he always ends with a call to action. <laughs> yep. So, and, and and many speeches like that part at the end, like you know, the, they have to have some action, something has to happen, or the crowds have to act, or I'm sorry, the the uh, audience has to act on something. Uh, to, to the points of Eileen, you know, it's it's a really difficult situation because he was saying that when in 1981, is that right? Yes, 1981. Speech. Yes. What has changed? Tell me. <laughs> Nothing. Okay, we're still there. All right, and uh, the, maybe that's a sad part, but uh, as uh, as an excellent order, if you want to say. The call to action was there. It was clear what he wanted to happen. There were some parts that were a little confusing, but essentially the, the, the steps were there. But what was evident in the steps was his belief that, uh, you know, that as a, as a people, we could do it. That's what he it was anchored on, that we could have that situation where the government was controlling things, but it wasn't run by one family. Okay, uh, the, the, that kind of contrast. So he believed essentially in the goodness of of the the Pinoy, and that that was part of his appeal, if you want to say that he believed that no matter what, there was still hope. It was funny because I was in a I was in a uh, contest, uh, table topics, and the question was, uh, is the Filipino worth dying for? <laughs> okay. <Wow. laughs> Uh, and I said no. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I said, look, I was there in uh, uh, Etza one, not, not at Etza. I was, I was, I did go to Etza, but I didn't stay there long. I went to the other site uh, where the stations were, where the TV okay. stations were. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it, we're, it was it was a little scary, it was a little tense because there was an armored personnel carrier there, and there was a young graduate from the PMA. He was like the the commander, and the guy standing next to me was his brother. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and we're oh. out there <laughs> and saying, "Oh boy, what's going to happen?" And I was imagining if he started shooting, I said I wouldn't have stood there and died. I would have just run away. <laughs> <laughs> So it it does take really a special person to have that kind of belief, and and to to which is exactly what he's known for. Back to you, Raul. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and just to add to that, uh, uh, I remember over there by at that uh, station. I don't, I'm not sure if it's uh, Channel Two or GMA Seven, but that's the same place where you had this uh, Mitsubishi Zero. <laughs> That uh, did the flyby <laughs> over there, <laughs> and then yeah, the Tora Tora. <laughs> yeah, that, they called it Tora Tora. Tora. <laughs> so why did they call it? Oh yeah, it was featured in a particular movie. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know the the funny thing is they, that Mitsubishi Zero was just flying around, uh, but it wasn't shooting anything. So, <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm not, I just wasn't sure if it was for wreck or not. Uh, Reconnaissance, but uh, you know, if that if it had machine guns and started shooting, oh my gosh, you'd really have to run very fast. <laughs> 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 okay, on to you, Dino, please. You would have to because uh, aircraft um, usually have uh, uh, of that vintage usually carry fifty or at least thirty caliber rounds, and those are anti-material. So it would penetrate to pretty much anything. You, it wouldn't matter if you hit behind anything because it would just punch right through. Now, having said that, I'd like to react to his definition of social, um, what do you call it? Social. Uh, Christian socialism. Yeah. Christian socialism. 
um, I think what he meant was he desired a, a more centralized form of government that was somehow moral at the same time. Uh, and and uh, because our country's uh, constitution and form of government is patterned so much after the United States, he saw that there, there, there were flaws. Like, for example, why is it that when you go to New York or you go to uh, other areas like Los Angeles, they have very strict gun laws and yet very permissive laws in places like Texas or, or Florida or Nevada. You know, uh, some of them will even have very short waiting periods before you could get your hands on a, on a firearm. So um, I understood where he came from in the sense that we can't have one part of the country wanting something and not letting the others have it as well. Uh, I think he was after equality, uh, true equality. So uh, I in the French model, which is socialist, uh, egality, fraternity, liberty, you know. <laughs> uh, and so, but that hasn't worked out all that well for them either. I mean, there was a lot of head chopping. A lot <laughs> uh, if you were of royal blood, you were in big trouble. Uh, my point simply was, um, he was very idealistic. Because I'm with Paul here, that if you really think about it, has anything changed? The answer is no. Uh, would I myself uh, think that the Filipino is worth dying for? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> because uh, we're so behaved when we're in other countries. But here in the Philippines, we, we are uh, very anarchic in character. You know, uh, I mean, think about it. News these days talk about uh, Mindanao wanting to secede. But, you know, it's not really Mindanao wanting to secede, but somebody out there wanting to secede <laughs> you know so More like um, wanting not to go to prison <laughs> just, just kidding there you go <laughs> <laughs> so um the the need for centrality in governance is is crucial because a country has to be able to speak with one voice especially we have a threat of a uh, foreign aggressor start to grab bits and pieces of our territory we we can't have two different factions deciding the fate and, and where we stand. So we need uh, centrality. But at the same time, it's very clear in his speech that there has to be morality, a sense of morality mm -hmm. and uh, accountability for it to work. Back to you, Raul. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dino. Uh, indeed, yes, I agree. For, uh, for, a for a government, for a society to function well, the leaders uh, need to exercise morality and take accountability for what uh, what happens. Mm. Thank you. And uh, are we? Is there anything more from the recording that we're going to be listening um, to? Do you know? Uh, at this point, I think we, we've we've listened uh, to enough of it, uh, mm -hmm. which is a fair sampling of Ninoy mm -hmm. as a as a public speaker. And yes. my guess is he wrote his own stuff. <laughs> so, um, maybe I'd just like to add one more thing. Our country currently has more of a feudal system. I, you know, not so much a democratic system, but more like a feudal system because, you know, we have dynasties and you know, that sort of thing. So, <laughs> uh, we resemble more Japan before they became democratic than, than we do the U.S., yeah, so mm -hmm. that that's that's all I wanted to add. Oh yes, oh uh, yes, uh, well, yes. So especially when you talk about uh, uh, families uh, in politics, yeah. <laughs> kind of reminds you of yes of uh, feudal feudal Japan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, well, folks, and uh, before we conclude, I'd like to remind everyone, please. Don't miss episode six of Tip Talks. This is where we will analyze the speech of past president Ferdinand Marcos. This is the speech that he delivered in the United States. And we hope that uh, you'll get to join us, especially as we share our insights on 
President Marcos' speech. As ever, learning is a never-ending journey with limitless distance. <laughs>